Um, so, so if it's okay with you guys, we will record this, and then if there's certain points you just want to be off the record, just let us know. And we'll, we'll, Nothing. We will, we will honor that. Um, <laughs> the part where we're stuffing our faces. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So I thought this would be this is kind of like a fitting discussion to have on election day. Um, uh, you know, because election day represents so much about being a citizen, but citizenship is so much more than just voting. And I think we at Chris talk a lot about this kind of uh, area that these two that these two focus on a good deal, which is you know there's this there's this voting there's there's the voting there's a focusing on elections and there's particularly at Grist historically we focus a lot a lot on what's going on at the federal level, and then we then we find it easy and our users our readers are often interested in like what can I individually do in terms of like my buying behavior my consumption. But we know that those 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 changes only add up to so much. And the federal level, as we write about all the time, and David writes about, is just kind of a little bit stuck and broken. And there's this big area in between, which is really civic engagement. And so that's why I think it's like super fitting to have these guys here with us today to talk about this stuff. Um, so um, as I think everyone knows, Nick Hanauer is a VC here in town, um, and. In fact, Nick, you invest in a bunch of media properties over time, don't you? Among, among, I mean, startups, but including some media. Mm -hmm. um, so, so there might be things, questions you guys might have that pertain to that yep. stuff as well. Um, but uh, Nick is also, um, well, I guess, sort of funny enough, in this Bloomberg piece, you just you're sort of self-described as a fat cat who who is very focused on progressive politics and uh, progressive policies, and um, as such, I think you're really helping to change the conversation in this state mm -hmm. and this country on those issues, so we're, we're so honored to have you here. Um, and Eric Liu is someone I first met probably <coughs> 13 years ago or so. Yeah. Eric was, at that point, the boss of my wife when she was like 12. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, and um, so, so I met Eric when he was at Real Networks. He had recently come from the White House, where he was a speechwriter. And um, and then I think after Real, Eric kind of had this chapter where I sort of thought of him as almost I never told you this, but sort of like the Terry Gross of Seattle, kind of bringing together public inter intellectuals, helping to lead the intellectual conversation in this country in various forms of media. But he's since gone on to become kind of such a do-gooder on the ground, involved with various causes and various boards and. Uh, Eric's group, uh, he sort of does his work now out of this organization called the Guiding Lights Network, um, which is really helping to spur the conversation around citizenship and civic engagement around the country. So, so anyway, you guys, we're so pleased to have you here. And their, their most recent book, they put out two together, is The Gardens of Democracy. Handsome book. Um, and so I just wanted to start things off by getting you guys talking a little bit about the, the concepts in the book. and maybe articulating a little bit like a, this machine brain <coughs> versus garden brain, what those terms mean to you, and and um, uh, just bring it to life. Um, and we have, I need to warn you, we have some gardening experts here. All right. So. <laughs> <laughs> We're not. So we'll yeah, try exactly. very well. <laughs> We're amateurs. I've yeah. been gardening since I was 16 years old. <laughs> I, I garden regularly and not very successful. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, thank you, first of all, yeah. uh, for having us here. Um, someone will tell us if we have salad in our teeth, right? <laughs> um, and thank you guys for, for uh, coming to this conversation. Um, let, let's just start with the title of this book, Gardens of Democracy, because um, the title basically <clears throat> embodies an argument that we're making uh, that so much of American life, of economic life and civic life and just uh, the, the way we move in public, is framed through the metaphor of the machine. Think about the economy, the language. You just flip open the paper on almost any day at random. The language you'll find about the economy is the language of a big cogs and gears machine that's firing on all cylinders, or it's stalling. It, it needs to, you know, the, the, the engine's overheating, or it, whatever. There's all this machine mechanistic <clears throat> language. And the same is true for political and civic life. We think literally of political machines. Uh, we think about our role as citizens in these very atomistic, mechanistic terms. We, the relationship that we have to government is often characterized by, uh, you know, kind of akin to the relationship that you have uh, with a vending machine that just ate your quarters and you're annoyed and you're kicking it. Um, and you keep pressing the same button and the candy bar doesn't come out. Um, and, and part of the most basic argument we're making is that that metaphor, though it has some utility, 
uh, in some deep, deep ways, blinds us to how the world really works and blinds us to what we should really be doing uh, in the economy and in civic life and in the role of government. And that uh, these things are not understood properly through what we call machine brain, but rather through garden brain. If you see the world, if you see the economy, for instance, uh, not as some perfectly efficient, self-regulating, self-correcting machine, but rather as a garden. A garden that, left to itself, will certainly grow uh, and, and yield robust growth for a while, but then eventually will be overrun by noxious weeds and will tip over and will die. The gardens require, among other things, gardeners. Right? They require weeding and feeding and seeding and tending. Uh, and that, that is true not only of uh, our economic lives, but <clears throat> probably just as much in our civic lives, that the health of a community, any neighborhood you're, you're in, if you think about life in this city, uh, is a garden. Sometimes literally, if you're talking pea patches and you're talking about you know, uh, uh, yard stri uh, parking strip gardens and the rest, uh, but often just much more figuratively, uh, that things either are tended or are not tended, that behaviors that <clears throat> can end up cascading into um, a, a culture and a, and a feeling and a vibe of civility and courtesy and community, um, if left untended, can tip toward a feeling and a vibe of incivility and lack of safety and, uh, and, and coldness. Um, and uh, so that's kind of the, the, the first kind of metaphorical argument we're making in the book. And when you start with that worldview, seeing things through garden brain rather than machine brain, it changes fundamentally the way that you think about um, the three chunks that we talk about in the book, the economy, citizenship, and uh, the role of government. Um, you want to talk about those? Yeah, well, <coughs> let me, well, I, here, put the, step away from the brownie. <laughs> <laughs> right? um, uh, I, I just wanted to underscore a point that Eric made, or, or, or put it a slightly different way, and that is that I, I don't want, to, you know, we don't want to leave you with the impression that we made this choice about metaphors for for um, for aesthetic or reason. <coughs> it's not it's not just a poetic difference uh, between these two different ways of looking at the world. They actually, in, in our view, in the central argument of the book, reflect reflect a, a, a realistic and versus an unrealistic way of looking at the world. And and by that I mean that over the last 30 or 40 years, there's been this revolution in our understanding of how complicated systems work, particularly human social systems like economies. And um, for the prior several hundred years, we either consciously or unconsciously conceptualized them as linear, mechanistic, and closed, um, which is why when you, you know, buy a magazine like The Economist and talking about the economy, the, 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 the illustration that they use on the front will be this sort of, inter, this sort of Rube Goldberg inter, interlocking gears and mechanisms um, um, illustration of what's happening. And it turns out that that's, that, that's, that's just not true. It, it, you know, um, a, a human social system like an economy is, isn't linear, mechanistic, and closed. It's complex, adaptive, and ecosystemic. And, 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 and the point really worth underscoring is that the economy in particular isn't just, isn't similar to an ecosystem, it actually is an ecosystem, just like a natural ecosystem. And it, it's characterized by the same sorts of forces and, 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 and stuff. So when you realize that an economy is ecosystemic uh, and not mechanistic and linear, you come to very different conclusions about what's going on. And, uh, and you don't just shape policy when you do that. If you change the metaphors that people use to understand <coughs> things, you change intuitions and with it polit po politics and culture, right? So it, let me give you a great example. So if your view of the world is mechanistic and linear, linear then one more fish out of the sea is just one more fish out of the sea. But if you understand it as a complex adaptive system uh, that's characterized um, uh, um, as, you know, like ecosystems are, then one, wish, one more fish out of the sea may be the fish that causes uh, a, a series of cascading events which eliminate fish from the sea, right? And, um, and 
uh, you know, a group of citizens who think about fish and the sea in that latter way are probably going to make better choices about how many fish to take out of the sea than people who think about it in the former way. And so, so you guys are mostly younger than me, but you, you know this phrase, tipping point, right? So Malcolm Gladwell um, uh, popularized this <coughs> idea and wrote a book about that idea. Uh, but that idea, um, which which most people now understand and intuit, um, was absent from human understanding not not very many years ago, right? The, and the guys that invented that idea, two guys named Parabach and Kan Chen, they're physicists, and they wrote this amazing paper called Self-Organized Criticality. Uh, and what they discovered is that, that you know, things... That, you know that, that complicated systems don't react linear to stimulus. They react on the non-linearly. They cascade. They, you know, you, you have these, you know, buildups and then catastrophes and stuff like that. And that and that and they wrote a paper and I think it was published in the mid '80s. And 25 years later, Malcolm Gladwell finally writes a book about it. Now everybody kind of understands tipping points. But the point the point of our book is that when you advance people's notions about how the world fits together in this newer way, um, they end up uh, with intuitions and perspectives about what's good and what's bad that are really different from the old way. And, 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 and you know, when I think about what you're trying to do, I think mostly that's what you're trying to do, is get people to realize that one more fish out of the sea maybe bad, <laughs> right? Not just, this is not one more fish. But you can't get there unless you have this understanding of the system of complex and that. You know, one thing that um, occurs to me, we should have come bearing books, and we can get you all some books, uh, copies of Gardens of Democracy, but I really like to We have some that we can sort of. Okay, so, okay, so yeah. as you'll see when you get a chance to, to flip through it, um, We've taken some of these ideas, which, as Nick is saying, are are not just poetry, but are also, I mean, they are poetry, but they're also derived from cutting-edge science of the last couple of decades, right? Uh, but what we've tried to do is take some of these insights and put them into simple precepts uh, that have the force of proverb or maxim, you know, that uh, can be just grabbed onto, and that anybody, particularly you, um, since you're in the word and idea and image and story business, uh, can run with. And so let me just kind of walk you through the four or five precepts that we have in the book. Cause they, will, they, they will be a good way to hang different parts of our conversation. Um, so, so one of the first ones um, uh, starts with challenging the, the notion of what counts as self-interest uh, in American politics and economics. Right? We, 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 we hear a language all the time uh, about Basically, you know, variations on greed is good. Variations on, you know, thousand acts of selfishness yield a common good, right? This is the story of the, the, the hidden hand of the marketplace. Uh, it's a story of um, e even our constitutional scheme in some ways, uh, uh, and checks and balances and faction, you know, set against faction. Uh, but our argument on self-interest is that when you see things the way we're talking about here in these in, in these ecosystemic, interconnected ways, where all our fates are entwined. Um, that maxim number one is true self-interest is mutual interest. That there is no, no, that there is no way today uh, that you can just cut off uh, your pleasure from someone else's pain, cut off someone else's fate from your own. Uh, and that, uh, or another way to put it is, as we were talking about before, what goes around comes around, right? And, and this isn't just a karmic, you know, wish or aspiration or or or, or, or notion, but it is science. It is fact, right? Uh, so that, that's tr true self-interest is mutual interest. Uh, on the economy, uh, on citizenship, one of the things that um, we really also try to push against uh, is this dominant American ethic that basically says, hey, it's a free country, man. I should be able to do whatever I want as long as I'm not actively like hurting you, right? Um, which is essentially a variation on don't tread on me, right? Uh, and that is deep, deep, deeply ingrained in the American DNA and character. Uh, and we don't propose to eliminate that, but we do propose to couple it uh, with, again, this other understanding of citizenship, which boils down to this precept, society becomes how you behave. 
right? So you can't just say, well, I'm going to be kind of a selfish jerk here, but it's okay, it all kind of comes out in the wash because someone else is being a nice altruist, right? Uh, and, and, you know, no, no, if you are, you know, if you are behaving X right now, uh, a cascade of X behavior will ensue, right? Uh, you are always, by your actions and omissions, setting off contagions uh, of behavior. Uh, society becomes how you behave. But one that, I've not even seen this on Grist, actually. I, I'm very fond of quoting this example. Uh, I saw a picture of a billboard by a very congested highway in Portland. Is this ringing any bells to anybody? Um, it might have been for a bike share uh, program or something, but the billboard's very simple and plain. It said, um, you're not stuck in traffic, you are traffic. <laughs> right? <clears throat> um, which is essentially the message of society becomes how you behave. Yeah. Right? You, you, you form these things. You can't kind of cleave yourself off from them right? and say, there's a problem over here. We have bad politics, or we have a crummy neighborhood, or, you know, that's you, right? Th th that's you. Um, on, can, 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 again, yeah. I just want to underscore some of the science. So, so it's possible, um, it's plausible that somebody should be able to do whatever they want to do, as long as it doesn't hurt any, anyone else, if your uh, worldview is atomic, right? It, if you conceptualize the world as sort of, you know, disconnected agents. But, you know, once you... You know, network theory has displaced that idea. And, and it's very, very clear today, indisputable in fact, that, that, that we are not atomized, we're networked. Every single one of us is, is, is a node on a network. And in a network, um, the behavior of one of those nodes affects the behavior uh, in the rest of the network. Um, and, and again, these are now matters of fact. If you smoke, the people around you are more likely to smoke, and the people around those people are more likely to smoke. These behaviors are as contagious as diseases. And so, and, 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 and this is, you know, one of the essential characteristics of complex <coughs> adaptive systems is that they, is that the shape of them is a consequence of the behavior of the individual parts. You know, you, you show me water in motion, uh, you show me turbulence, I will show you whirlpools. Right? It, 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 you have to have it. And so in that very real sense, in that very literal sense, Society becomes how you behave. I want to use another example. So you guys remember the giant uh, mortgage meltdown, right? So just before this happened, our Filipino, a marvelous woman, Filipino housekeeper, uh, decided she wanted to build a house, uh, buy a house, and we share her with another family, and and and. Um, we, we, we were very happy to help her go do that. Um, uh, and uh, she went out to get a mortgage, and we assumed that we would co-sign a mortgage for her. And when she applied for the mortgage, the mortgage broker told her that, uh, that w w it would not be helpful if we were to co-sign on that loan for that house. Um, and I found it shocking that somebody would not want uh, somebody like me to co-sign on a note for a for a you know a woman who frankly doesn't make that much money, right? And and uh, and you know my, my you know the other family they're very prosperous too. We live in a beautiful neighborhood, and, and so it was sort of shocking to us that no one would want uh, our co-signature on this loan. Uh, but we sort of blew it off, and we were like, oh, well, you know, all good, you know, except it wasn't, was it? <laughs> it wasn't all good. You know, like like the fact that we, we actively participated in a process that was clearly corrupt and, cr and insane. <laughs> it was insane to give this woman, I, no, it wasn't insane to give her the loan, it was insane that, that the people giving the loan cared so little about being repaid that they would pass on having somebody like me guarantee <laughs> it. You know, like, so, and, and so you can blame Wall Street for that collapse, but you can also blame somebody like me for, for you know, animating that cycle of, 
corruption, right? You know, there we were, pushing it along. Wahoo, you know, and but then then we weren't and it got very good, got much more expensive for everybody. If we had just co signed on those loans. So anyway, I just yeah. 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 So. Well, uh, just quickly, the, the yeah. other two precepts for, from the book, just to frame up our, our, our thinking. Um, one, one actually was a great segue from what <clears throat> it's talking about in terms of the Great Recession and the, uh, and the financial collapse. Um, our argument about the economy um, boils down to this sentence, which is, we're all better off when we're all better off. Right? And again, this may sound like glib and tautological, but there, there actually is the same kind of argument here about how things interconnect, right? And as we'll get into in a moment, the prevailing orthodoxy that flows from a machine brain atomistic view of how an economy works basically says, hey, this is a perfectly efficient market. If some people are, are raking, it, raking it in and making a lot of money and, uh, and inequality is getting worse, so be it, right? Uh, that must just be because they are exceptionally talented people, right? Um, and uh, whereas if you actually see the economy in these ecosystemic complex adaptive system terms, uh, what you realize is that whatever the talent level of the 1% who are uh, accumulating so many income and wealth gains over these last few decades, the fact of the matter is that that kind of concentration of wealth um, is not just you know unfair, it's really harmful. It's stupid for the entire economy because when you have, to use a different metaphor, that much blood in your body concentrated in one, say, pinky, the rest of the body cannot thrive, right? The rest of the body cannot breathe. The rest of the body cannot literally function. And the argument that we make in uh, the Gardens of Democracy is truly that when we're all better off, we're all better off. When you have a strong middle class that has the purchasing power to participate in the economy, uh, then everybody prospers. Right, including the wealthy, uh, uh, but that is a, that's a whole other argument that, that we get into. That's uh, uh, that's very, of course, uh, uh, hot right now, uh, both in this election season and just because of our economy. The last one has to do with the role of government. And I think this, you know, Chip mentioned that so much of the thinking and the, and the ideas that you're reckoning with um, have to do with um, taking sustainability, climate change, these these interconnected issues. Um, either out of the federal realm, where things are very broken, right, or out of the realm only of abstract ideas and back to where things can get operationalized a bit, which is often cities, right, which is often communities of a human scale where stuff can happen, right? Um, and one of our arguments about the role of government in the guards of democracy is that we've had such a tiresome debate, basically all your lives, last several decades, um, in this country, and we still have it in this presidential campaign about should we have big government or should we have small government? But that's what it boils down to over and over again, right? Uh, and our argument is that basically that's the wrong way to frame things up, that what we need is government that is big on the what and small on the how, right? That there is a role for a government that takes a strong judgmental point of view about what counts as a good objective, right? Having the oceans not rise turns out to be a good objective, right? Uh, but then government that is far less hands-on than we've come to think of a great society post, you know, 60s uh, federal government operating in, far more hands-off, far more open to bottom-up innovation, network problem solving, um, local experimentation, uh, as to how you get at those big goals, right? Uh, and, and so big what, small how uh, is the theory of government that we put forward in this book that I think is particularly pertinent to um, some of the policy questions that some of you are, are, are working on. Um, and so, you know, these precepts, true self-interest is mutual interest, society becomes how you behave, we're all better off and we're all better off, um, and we need government that's big on the what and small on the how, um, are all kind of situated in this worldview that Nick and I are talking about that says, you know, we are all, whether or not we like it, we are all entwined and our fates are connected this way. Um, and so we have to start thinking in these uh, ecosystemic terms if literally we as a country are going to not just uh, grow up but, but uh, survive. Let me, I mean, I have some additional questions, but let me just, anyone have any questions? David? I have kind of a nerdy question. <laughs> um, <coughs> one of the things I do a lot of reading and writing about is, um, 
economic analysis of climate change, climate change impacts and climate change policy. And most of what passes for economic analysis now is this sort of, is very much along these mechanistic lines that you're describing, this kind of cost benefit. You have this rising line of damages and the rising cost of climate policy and wherever those cross, that's your sweet spot and you spend exactly you know, $412.32 is the right, you know, the right amount to spend avoiding climate change. And, you know, I'm dissatisfied with that because I feel like it misses this ecosystemic perspective. And lots of people are dissatisfied with it, but it, there's not, it's not clear exactly what the alternative is or exactly, you know, one of the benefits of this mechanistic economic analysis is that it produces clear answers for policymakers who yes. want clear answers and want and, and, and numeric nice values. line slopes. And <coughs> yeah. Yes. So it's not, <coughs> it, I wonder if you have any thoughts on what is the alternative what is the alternative economics uh, of how you approach this? Well, I mean, one of the answers to the question, of course, is, is to reject the presumption that these, mo the, 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 these systems are linear, right? Because you only get a line like that if it's a linear system. Um, and, 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 and the truth is that, um, you know, it's like that. <laughs> the problem is, is that all of a sudden you get a Sandy three times a year. And now the entire coastline of the east, the, the now the uh, the entire eastern seaboard is no longer habitable. And but you're but, like, but I mean shit. The, the consequence of that is, is <laughs> massive uncertainty. If you have these right. possible phase shifts, you have a future that's incredibly yes. blurry and threatening. How do you make economists and or policymakers comfortable making decisions in the face of that? Well, I mean. I, and this is just this is the point. This is the big, great battle is to get people to realize that that another ton of carbon is not just another ton of carbon, right? That the effects of this are are not going to be uh, predictable, linear, and friendly. They're going to be massively uh, uh, unpredictable, and uh, ultimately uh, they will lull you into <coughs> sleep and then wipe you from the face of the earth. And 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 I, I think that. You know, it's really one of the great phase transitions of our time. What Eric and I call in our book, The New Enlightenment, is getting people to go from this viewpoint that they have had basically since the Enlightenment and since the dawn of the scientific method that these things, that, that lines slope like that, right? That that's how the world works. It's like, you know, you know, little input, little output, little input, little output, not, and, and, and you know, there is this great, you know, the, the, the truth <coughs> is that, that, that it's only been a couple of three decades that people have understood that this, that this is not true, right? It's not like 300 years have gone by with people understanding nonlinearity, right? And so people, people's intuitions about future risks are need to change, and we need to bring them along so that pe policymakers will be, uh, you know, will be um, encouraged to take different kinds of. I, I would amend that yeah. that last thought slightly, actually. Yeah. So, th this science and 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 these intuitions that that Nick just articulated are only a few decades old, right? Um, but in a sense. It actually, I think, is m is more appropriate to look at the era from I don't know the 1850s when kind of a physics-driven, you know, classical economics began to take shape. From that period till now, to look at that period as the aberration, right? To look at that period where we pretended we could have scientific, mechanistic, physics-oriented kind of certainty uh, about something like the economy. Before that, people, though they didn't have a language of science or big data and you know, uh, cloud computing to kind of model it out, they had deep, deep intuitions about everything we're talking about here. Every one of our precepts is you know, literally or distantly kind of you know, a cousin of something you could find biblically, right? Th th these are deep, deep intuitions about how the world actually works, right? Uh, and so. I think one of the things that we have to remember is um, we have, you know, we we are at this very interesting moment right now where um, because 
big data and, and, and new science allows us to pretend with even more precision that we can measure stuff and, and concretize stuff and, 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 and quantify stuff, it's tempting to think that we can find a new holy grail of certainty, right? I think we have to actually get to where we're comfortable with. There's a great deal of uncertainty, right? And the, and the nature of risk is such that responsible grown-up citizens and responsible grown-up countries plan for that uncertainty, particularly when we have generated a, a good deal of the drivers of the uncertainty, right? Um, that's one. Two, though, I mean, to your specific question about economics, you know, we're working with these folks uh, um, at Oxford and elsewhere, um, the Institute on New Economic Thinking. Um, uh, uh, and there's a growing, emerging discipline yeah. called complexity economics. Um, a guy named Eric Beinhocker. I would encourage you all um, to begin now and set two years hence uh, a time to finish reading this 700-page <laughs> <laughs> uh, called The Origin of Wealth by Eric Beinhocker. It's, just, it's a great, great synthesis of a lot of the science as applied to economics and how you can start to rethink a, a lot of the the way that we now kind of chart and graph things. Um, uh, but, but again, I, I, I do think that part of this, you know, I'm a baseball fanatic, um, and I, I feel about this stuff sometimes the way I feel about, if any of you are baseball people, sabermetrics. Um, and all, of, Nate Silver, who we're all like hanging on his every word, right? <laughs> uh, cut his eye teeth on sabermetrics and using data as applied to baseball, right? And trying to figure out various baseball outcomes. and. Uh, I'm for that to an extent, and then I'm for completely <coughs> locking it up and walking away from it. Uh, because, again, I, I do not like the false kind of hope or illusion that we're going to get a new generation of certainty because we have better models and better data. You know, um, I think, And so as to policymakers, it just means, you know, look, when, when Glass-Steagall was enacted out of the depths of the Great Depression, those guys, those economists then, and the policymakers then, didn't have access to the computing power or the science or the data that we have today. They just had an intuition about human nature uh, and about needing to kind of build in some guardrails uh, between commercial and investment banking. Uh, and that absent those guardrails, they knew that people would do what people do. Yeah. Um, and uh, you don't need science. You just need to kind of return to a sense of, uh, you know, ethical citizenship and some humility about what you think you can actually control. Uh, and, uh, and if that sounds a little bit conservative, you know, so, so be it. Like, I think there, 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 is, there is an appropriate element here of kind of epistemological conservatism, right, or humility about not thinking you can just make everything and fix everything and do everything. Um, and um, anyway, that, that's, that's... It's interesting, I mean, David's point it's like how do we how do you make policy in an era of uncertainty? <clears throat> I'm just trying to map it to your fourth principle, which is have a government of what, not how. But that implies that the what needs to be pretty clear, actually, very clear. You know, because <clears throat> that's if that's the defining goal. And so, and my, I haven't made the connections yet, but just sort of in this in a, in a time of uncertainty that embraces uncertainty. Is how easy is it to find the what? I guess. Well, I mean, so 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 <clears throat> one of the great. Uh, um, give you an example. One of the great uh, uh, debates we have today is whether it's what role government should play in, um, for instance, uh, green energy, right? And of course, you know, the, you know, um, it's easy to point to failures like Solyndra as a, as a you know. Oh, a, don't get us started. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a great example of you know why government should play. <laughs> and no, do and, uh, and 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 the. And the problem, the problem is, is that we live in a frame where people really think of government action in that way as, 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 as uh, um, picking, is attempting to pick winners. Uh, and, of, and of course, it is very, very difficult to pick winners. Um, I'm in the business of picking winners, and I'm among the best that there is at picking winners. And, and I can tell you that I very rarely pick winners. Right? <laughs> Mostly, it's failures. Um, and, 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 um, and hell, all I have to do is report to little old me. And I still end up, you know, with a lot of self-loathing. Thank God I, you know, you know, so, so, you know, it's no wonder that when, you know, government makes a mistake that there's a problem. But there's another way to think about it entirely, which is that the role of government isn't to pick winners, it's to pick games, right? It's to, it's to decide 
what domains we should compete in, and that's called strategy, right? Every successful organization picks a strategy, and those strategies sometimes are wrong, but no successful organization has ever been created that didn't have a strategy, <laughs> right? You have to have a strategy. You have to choose what you want to do, what you want to accomplish, and it is completely legitimate for government uh, to say, we want to win in the, in the domain of energy, which is some alternative to burning things. And now, what is it going to be? Who knows? You know, is it going to be wind? Is it going to be solar? Is it going to be geothermal? Is it going to be tides? We have no <coughs> idea, but that's our goal. Here are the mechanisms we put in place to let the, algor the, the powerfully algorithmic forces of the market to sort out what will work best, and off it goes. And, there, and yes, folks, there's going to be tons of failures, but we're going to end up with some successes and we're going to win. Framed in that way, right, as a strategy rather than as, you know, winner picking, you can yeah. make a lot of, you can make a lot of so progress. Have, do you guys, in, in, the, in the book, do you grapple with, um, I mean, I find that a very appealing description of how government ought to behave, but it pushes against almost every force of political economy, which is powerful interests don't want the government to set up a competitive yes. <laughs> whatever. They want government to, to help yeah. them win. You know, yes. there's no, yeah. there is no the powerful constituency <laughs> for, for competition. The nation. Yes, correct. Well, um, th there yeah. are a couple of um, hopeful signs. I guess uh, <clears throat> some coming from the federal government, some just just out there. Um, if any of you follow education policy, uh, one of the things that the president uh, has done that we think is a great uh, model mm -hmm. for how you can approach this is an education policy called Race to the Top. Um, if you don't know what Race to the Top is, basically what what the administration did, starting with the initial stimulus uh, funding, was to grab. Um, what was a small amount of stimulus money, but a giant amount of money for federal education spending, $4 billion, uh, and say, here's a pot of money. Here are three or four big goals that we want to foster in education reform, right? Uh, better uh, uh, leadership training for building leaders and principals, you know, more data-driven uh, systems, uh, you know, so on and so forth, right? Um, we now set forth and open up a competition among 50 states to see who can come up with the most interesting, effective, actionable plan to get at our four big goals. And we will award those states that have the most promising, creative, you know, interesting plans uh, a slice of this big pot of $4 billion, right? And it set off for the first year and a half of the administration this incredible, more action around education reform in more states around the country than decades of blue yeah. commissions or even yeah. presidents on bully pulpits yeah. talking about this stuff had done. You can quarrel with whether you liked, you know, the, the four things that they did, whether you like the Obama administration support of charter schools, blah, 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 right? That, 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 but the, but the, strat, the method yeah. um, was, you incredibly know, was incredible. And, and they've begun to replicate that in other domains now, kind of tucked away into the Affordable Care Act, our experiments of the same nature, that are of kind of a challenge grant nature. To there's, something, out. there's a, something mm -hmm. around green energy called ARPA-E, which exactly. is like DARPA, yep. which has been same pretty thing. successful. Yeah. Yep. But which, pouring that kind of stuff on. Right. Yeah. But the other one that's outside government is the X Prize, mm -hmm. right? Um, and all the things that have bloomed out there like it. Many of you probably know the Buckmin Buckminster Fuller Institute, you know, the BFI Prize, right? Same kind of thing, a giant amount of money against a big social goal and then, okay, teams, who can, who can come up with a great way to crack this nut, right? Um, that's kind of big what, small how, I, 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 you know, in a nutshell. And you're right, that entrenched, it's not even entrenched interest, it's more just kind of the entrenched habits of a lot of the bureaucracy can push against this. But I, but I think it's very possible, and it's especially possible, I think, at the city level. Like, I, I think we should be doing this times 10, times 100 here in Seattle on issue after issue, this kind of approach. Can I jump in? I would, I would like to, uh, just one of the things that occurred to me about it, talking to you guys uh, that, that I would love to share that, that has become so much 
it's such a big part of how I think about the problem of getting people to um, persuading people, I suppose. And 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 you know, a, a lot of my energy is uh, focused around economic inequality and and uh, new ways of understanding economies, uh, how an economy works. Um, and in particular, I've been fighting this fight around who, where prosperity comes from, who's a job creator. And there's this very central meme that is embraced on the left and right that rich business people like me are job creators. And if you just make it better for them, then uh, we, we will all be better off. And, um, and as, par as part of our um, writing this book, we get, we get to interact with a lot of really interesting and smart people. And John made a lot of contributions, but perhaps his most important is, coming, is, is showing how what we are is a consequence of evolution, that we have evolved to behave in particular ways. And, and when you understand things in that way, it explains a lot of our politics and policy and, and you know, just the peculiarities of how human beings relate to each other. And, and, and what, you know, I, I think that there, one of his most central findings that, that should be right, you know, right in front of you at all times is that people, human beings did, did, did not get made by evolution to, to to, to reason rationally. I mean, we, we run around with this idea that the beliefs we hold most dear, we've come to by this very sort of methodical, logical process, and we looked at the facts and we concluded that, you know, whatever it is, that, um, and, and it turns out that's just not true. Um, that, that, that most of our deepest beliefs uh, come from intuition and, and essentially moral reasoning and that we use data and evidence to rationalize those beliefs. And, um, and that, uh, and so you folks are all in the, in the business of persuading people <laughs> to care about uh, something that, um, that, you know, is, hard, is, is uncomfortable to believe. Right? And, and what John would tell you is that facts probably are not going to carry the day at the end of the day. Um, and, and, and you have to take another approach. And, and it, just in my own work, you know, I, I, I use this analogy a million times that, that you know, for 99% of human history, people believe that the Earth was the center of the solar system, you may recall. Right? And then along comes Copernicus and his buddy Galileo, and they're like, it's not true. The sun is the center of the solar system, and 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 you know when you do that, for instance, planetary motion goes from impossible to explain to completely obvious, right? And and again, you may recall, I'm paraphrasing, but you know as the people in charge at the time were deciding whether to burn Galileo at the stake or merely <laughs> throw him in jail for the rest of his life for suggesting that the Earth was not the center of the solar system, he was all, look through the telescope, look through the telescope, right? Because he invented the telescope. You look through the fucking telescope and you could see with your own eyes how this stuff worked. And what did they say to Galileo? You can stick your telescope up your ass, right? Because here's the only fact they cared about. That, that if Earth was diminished, so were they. <laughs> 